Hello boys and girls, a very good evening and welcome to this live session on quantitative aptitude for your IBPS pure prelims exam brought to you by Talent Sprint. Well, at the outset, I really apologize for uh, this delay in the start of the session today. I was stuck in something and, and hence the delay. So, apologies for the inconvenience cause, but I'm sure uh, we will cover all the questions that we had asked in the IBPS pure prelims already a mock exam which was conducted in the last weekend, right? Uh, for, for those who are new on Talentsman's platform, let me mention that in these sessions, we cover the questions that were asked in the Aldia mock exam. So we, these are basically kind of uh, refreshers for your upcoming exams. All right. And, uh, and I'm sure all of you have been a part of the reasoning session, which was held a day before yesterday. And also the general awareness in banking session, which is already over. All right. So I think without wasting our time anymore, let me quickly get started. I'll present the questions to you one after the other, uh, give you some time to try it out and then discuss the solution. Okay. So the first question from this session today is on your screens now. <coughs> now this is an independent question. It says A can complete a piece of work in eight days while B can complete the same work in 12 days. They work together for three days. Then A quits the work. In how many days will B now be able to finish the remaining work? In how many days will B now be able to finish the remaining work? Now that's a regular question type from time and work. I'm sure all of you know how to solve this. You have about one minute. Your time starts now. Well, I can see answers coming in now. 4.5 is what most of you have marked. Some of you have answered 3. I'm assuming you mean option 3 and not 3 days, right? Because the challenge here is we've also got 3 as an answer and 3 as an option. All right, so a very simple one. Uh, how do we solve this? Look at this. It says A can complete a piece of work in 8 days while B can complete the same work in 12 days. Right? A can complete something in 8 days. B can complete the same work in 12 days. They work together for 3 days. They work together for 3 days and then A quits the work. And then A quits the work. See, you know that the total work is 1 unit. The total work is always 1 unit, right? Work can be considered as 1 unit. Now, if A can do the whole work in 8 days, how much of work will you finish in 3 days? 3 eighths of the work is done. Right? A has done 3 eighths of the work. Are you able to follow? A can do the full work in 8 days. So in 3 days, he will be able to finish 3 eighths of the work. Look at B. B can do the full work in 12 days. So how much will he finish in uh, 3 days? 3 by 12. 3 by 12 or nothing but 1, one fourth of the work. Right? 25% of the work B can finish in 3 days. Right? B can finish the total work in 12 days. So if he has worked for 3 days, he will be able to finish 3 by 12, which is 1 fourth, 25%. Now, which, which means in the first three days, in the first three days, this much of work is over. 3 by 8 plus 1 by 4. 3 by 8 plus 1 by 4 can be taken as C. 1 by 4 can be taken as 2 by 8. So, 3 by 8 plus 2 by 8 is 5 by 8. 5 by 8. If 5 by 8 is done, how much is remaining? 3 8 is remaining. Yes or no? You have been able to finish 5 8 of the work in three days. So, 3 8 is remaining. And this 3 8 should be done by whom? This 3 8 has to be done by B alone. Right? This will be done by B alone because A has left the work now. A quits the work. So in how many days will B finish the remaining work? Now you know that B can do the total work in 12 days. B can do the total work in 12 days. So in how many days will he do uh, 3 8 of the work? In 3 8 of 12 days. Right? So your required answer will be 3 by 8 into 12. 3 by 8 into 12. How much will that be? This is like 3 into 3 by 2. You know 12 by 8 is 3 by 2. So 3 into 3 by 2 is 4.5. So 4.5 days option 3 is the answer. Right? 4.5 days, option 3 would be the answer. I'm sure that was a straight one, no confusion there. All I would suggest is cut down the number of steps that you put on paper. Right? Like for example, 3 8 of the work done by A, 1 4 of the work done by B. So 3 by 8 plus 1 by 4, you should be able to add mentally. It's a simple calculation, right? 3 by 8 plus 1 by 4. Take 1 by 4 as 2 by 8. So 3 by 8 plus 2 by 8 will be 5 by 8. 5 8 is done, 3 8 is remaining. Now that 3 8 should be multiplied by 12 to get the required answer. Even that calculation can be done mentally, right? So 4.5 days, option 3 is the right answer. Mm -hmm. Let's quickly move to the next one. There's another one here uh, on time and work again. Uh, here's the question. Mm -hmm. Try it out. A, B and C can do a work in 16 days, 12, 4 by 5 days and 32 days respectively. They started the work together, but A left after 4 days. But A left after 4 days. B left the work three days before the completion of the work. In how many days the work was completed? So this is a uh, level above the previous one. Here we have got three persons. They start the work together, but A leaves after four days. A leaves after four days. B left the work three days before the completion of the work. 
B left the work three days before the completion of the work. In how many days the work was completed? Let's take it up now. See what it says. A, B and C can do a work in 16 days, 12, 4 by 5 days and 32 days respectively. They started the work together but A left after 4 days. B left the work 3 days before the completion of the work. In how many days the work was completed? In how many ways the work was completed? Now let's assume the work was completed in D days. Let's, let's just write one equation to solve this. Let's assume the work was completed in D days. Now you see A's capacity is 1 by 16. A's capacity is 1 by 16. A worked for how many days? A worked for 4 days because he left after 4 days. So A worked only for 4 days. So this is the work, amount of work done by A plus amount of work done by B. See B left 3 days before the completion of the work. 3 days before the completion of the work. We are assuming that the work took D days. So 3 days before meaning B worked for D minus 3 days. At what capacity? See B can do the work in 12 4 by 5 days. Let's, let's simplify this. B can do the work in 12 4 by 5 days. Meaning uh, 64 by 5 days, right? 12 times 5 is 60, 60 plus 4, 64, 64 by 5 days. This is the number of days that B takes. So what will be his capacity? 5 by 64, 5 by 64. But then D worked only for D minus 3 days. Sorry, B, B worked only for D minus 3 days. This is the amount of work done by A. This is the amount of work done by B, right? A worked for 4 days at a capacity of 1 by 16. B worked for D minus 3 days at the capacity of 5 by 64. Plus the amount of work done by C. Now, there is no change in C's uh, days here, number of days for which C has worked, right? They started the work, which means C was a part of it. And there is no mention of C leaving the work at any point of time. So, which means C was there for all the D days, right? C was there for all the D days. And what is C's capacity? 1 by 32. So, C works with a capacity of 1 by 32 for D days. This is equal to the total work 1 unit, right? Work done by A plus work done by B plus work done by C is equal to 1. Now, simplify this for D and you will get the answer. Simplify for D and we get the answer, right? I think to make it simple, what we'll do is we can we can take the LCM as uh, uh, 64. Let's take the least common multiple here as 64. So 64 goes on the other side, right? So if we take 64, see again, I'm, I'm cutting down the intermediate step. I'll directly write here. I'm, I'm saying 64 is LCM and 64 goes on the right hand side. So this is 64. Now 16 goes how many times in 64? Four times. So this becomes 4 into 4, 16 plus 64 is anyway 64. So this is 5D minus 15. 5D minus 5 into 3 is 15 plus 32 goes 2 times. So this will be 2D. So 16 plus 5D minus 15 plus 2D equals to 64. Right? Now 16 minus 15 is 1. 64 minus 1 is 63. And 5D plus 2D is 70. So 7D equals to 63, which implies D is equal to 9 days. So option 5, 9 would be the answer. One equation, just this one equation has to be framed it properly. Which equation? This one the work equation. So capacity of A multiplied by the number of days for which A works. Capacity of B multiplied by the number of days for which B works. Capacity of C multiplied by the number of days for which C works. Right? I'm sure all of you have got the answer. You can in fact also do reverse engineering, right? Substitute the options back if you want and, and check which option satisfies. All right? So, so I think the calculation is your lookout, whichever you want to do, but the concept is very simple. Capacity into the number of days gives you the work done. That's the work equation you have to use. Okay, the next question here. This is from time and distance. It says distance between A and B is 112 kilometers. Arun and Varun started walking towards each other from A and B respectively in a straight route. Arun walked at 8 kilometers per hour while Varun walked at varying speed. His speed was 5 kilometers per hour during first hour, 6 during second hour, 7 during third hour and so on. At what time they will meet each other? At what time will they meet each other? 7.5 hours, option 3. Did you all get option 3, 7.5 hours? Yes, looks like all of you have got 7.5. Chandra Neeraj, Vishal, Divya, Lakshman, Dipankar, Yashaswini and <coughs> Shankar Rao. I'll wait for 15 more seconds. I'm sure some of you are still trying it out and then take it up. What method did you follow by the way? In the meanwhile, if you can tell me what method have you followed. Okay, I think some of you have changed your answers now or I think some other answer has been obtained. Varying speed, how to tackle it is what Anand Kumar has mentioned and we have Rajesh, Renuka, Anil and Shubham and Viru who have got option 5, none of these or, or rather 7 hours. Somyajit Roy says 7 hours. Neeraj is also corrected. Neeraj was the first one to respond by the way. Neeraj, mm -hmm. you were the first one to respond. Recall, you said 7.5 immediately. But now you find that you are wrong. 7 hours is the answer you say. Alright, so let's take it up. Let's, let's see what happens. Here we go. Uh, so the question is interesting. It says distance between A and B is 112 kilometers. 
Arun and Varun started walking towards each other from A and B respectively in a straight route. Arun walked at a speed of 8 km per hour, while Varun walked at varying speed. Right? Arun walked at 8 km per hour, while Varun walked at varying speed. Now his speed was 5 km per hour during the first hour, 6 km per hour during the second hour, 7 km per hour during the third hour and so on. At what time will they meet each other? At what time will they meet each other? Right? So, so if you understand what is the situation here, we have got two points A and B. The distance between the two points is 112 kilometers. Right? 112 kilometers is the distance between these two points. Okay. Now, let's say Varun starts from point A. And, or, or rather, let's say Arun starts from point A. Arun starts from point A and Varun starts from point B. And they are going towards each other. So, Arun goes towards Varun and Varun goes towards Arun in the straight line. Arun's speed is constant. Arun runs at a speed of 8 kilometers per hour, right? 8 kilometers per hour is his speed. But Varun has got a typical walking style, right? He is walking at a varying speed. His speed was 5 kilometers per hour in the first hour, then 6 kilometers per hour during the second hour, right? 7 kilometers per hour during the third hour, and so on. Meaning, if you observe each hour, in the, in the first hour it was 5 kilometers per hour, in the second hour it was 6 kilometers per hour, in the third hour it was 7 kilometers per hour and so on. So each hour, each hour his speed increases by 1 kilometer per hour, right? So in the fourth hour it will be 8 and so on, right? Now the simple idea is, uh, now the, the question says, I'm sorry, the, okay, the question says, uh, at what time they will meet each other? At what time they will meet each other? So since they are moving towards each other, there will be, uh, after some time they will come across each other, right? Let's say this is the path, they will meet somewhere. So after how many hours will they meet is the question. After how many hours will they meet is the question. Now if you if you go by the <coughs> hourly calculation, can you tell me how much distance will be covered in the first hour? See in the first hour Arun covers 8 kilometers. Arun covers 8 kilometers distance out of this 112. In the first hour Varun covers only 5. In the second hour Arun covers again another 8. In the second hour Varun covers 6. In the third hour again Arun covers 8. Varun covers 7 and so on. Are you able to follow? So, so if you if you observe, if you observe, we can we can either go by the options. One way to deal with it is go by options, but you have to be very quick in your calculation. You got to be very quick in your calculation. How is that? I'll tell you. For example, if you look at option 1, 8 hours. So if, if option 1 is considered as the answer, let's say if you go by options. If you consider option 1 as the answer, then what happens? You are saying Arun walked for 8 hours and Varun also walked for 8 hours. Now tell me how much will Arun cover in 8 hours? 8 into 8, 64. Yes or no? Arun covers 8 kilometers per hour. So in 8 hours he will cover 8 into 8. How much will Varun cover in 8 hours? See Varun will cover 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12. Every hour, right? First hour, second hour, third hour, fourth hour, fifth hour, sixth hour, seventh hour, eighth hour. This total should be equal to 112. See, this is 64 kilometers and this is whatever number of kilometers. This total has to be 112 kilometers. If it comes out to be 112, then 8 hours is the answer. If it is not 112, then depending on what you have got, you can decide whether you have to take more than 8 or less than 8. Right? Let's, let's do this calculation. Right? It's a simple calculation. See, because I'm explaining it appears to be lengthy. But when, if, you, if you have this idea, verifying options would take like, each option would take about, uh, you know, 7, 8, 10 seconds at best. And, and you will know what, what is the answer quickly. For example, let's, let's do this, option 1. So 8 into 8 is 64. Right, look at this. 5 plus 6, 11 plus 7, 18 plus 8, uh, 26 plus 9, 35 plus 10, 45 plus 11, uh, 56 plus 12, 68. 64 plus 68. How much is 64 plus 68? 64 plus 68 is 1, uh, <coughs> 120 and 12, right? 132. They have covered 132 kilometers. So immediately, see, option 1 is not the answer because in 8 hours they were supposed to cover 112 kilometers. But if, if you run for 8 hours, they are covering 132 kilometers, 132 kilometers. So option 1 is not an answer. Moreover, you also know that answer has to be less than 8. Answer should be less than 8 hours. Why is it so? Because in 8 hours they are covering 132. Yes or no? Did we do something? 8, 8, 64. This calculation did you verify? 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8, right? 11, 18, 26, 35, 45. 56 and 68, yeah. So answer has to be less than 8 hours, that is for sure. Answer has to be less than 8 hours. 
Now, less than eta's meaning what? Why, why am I saying less than eta's? Because in eta's if they have got 112 for covering one, uh, in eta's if they have got 132 for covering 112, they'll take less than eta's obviously. So 10 hours also is eliminated. Likewise, if you find more than eta's, any option which is more than it can be eliminated. Now, there are two options left out here. 6 hours, 7.5 hours and so on. Right? Now, the calculation becomes very easy. Like for example, this is for 8 hours. Let's say this is for 8 hours. If you, if you just want to do a verification, how will you do it for 7 hours? How will you do it for 7 hours? 8 into 7. Because this fellow worked only for 7 hours, right? Each hour he traveled 8 kilometers, only for 7 hours. Plus, in this calculation of 68, you have to remove 12, the last 12. This will be 68 minus 12. Because this 12 will not come into picture. First hour, second hour, third hour, fourth hour, fifth hour, sixth hour, seventh hour. This 12 will not be there in the picture. Now what's the total? Check. 8 into 7, 56. And 68 minus 12 is also 56. 56 plus 56, 112. You're getting 112 kilometers. In how many hours? 7 hours. And that's what we want, 112 kilometers in 7 hours. So I can now say that 7 hours option 5, none of this is the answer. 6 hours and 7.5 hours also ruled out. Are you able to follow? Are you able to follow? I'm just giving you a simple verification where you have to add numbers. That is it. And you'll know what the answer is. Now you may say, why will you do for 7 hours? Because it's not given in the options. Yes, you may not do for 7 hours. Do it for 6 hours. Do it for 6 hours meaning what? For option 2, I'll take 8 into 6, 48. Plus, from this 68, I'll remove 11 and 12. 11 and 12 is how much? 23. 68 minus 23 it will be 45. 48 plus 45 will not give me 112. So, this is not the answer. Do it for 7.5. Do it for 7.5. How will you do it for 7.5? See, 8 into 7.5. 8 into 7.5 is 60. Plus, here up to 10 you have to consider. This 12 will not be there and half of this will be there. This is for 6 hours. 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 is 6 for 6 hours. Plus 5.5. Half hour. 11 half. Half of 11. 5.5. You understand? So basically 12 plus 5.5. 17.5 should be removed from uh, 68. 17.5. Now that is giving me a non-integer value. Yes or no? I want total 112. It is very clear that I will be getting something which ends in 0 0.5. 0 0.5. Right? But I want the answer to end with 2 third option is also not the answer. So obviously answer has to be option 5. Answer has to be option 5, none of this. That is one way of solving it, right? I mean, I am explaining you, I am explaining you how to verify using options. I am not saying this is the method that all of you should have followed. But if you understand that, see the best part here is, we are doing an hourly calculation. Instead of considering total 8 hours, 9 hours and all, all, all that, we know that every hour this fellow covers 8 hours, every hour this fellow will cover 5, 6, 7 and so on. So find out when the sum will come out to be 112. For how many intervals will some come out to be 112? And that should help you. That should help you get the answer. If you said no, we want a regular method. The regular method is relative speed. See, these two persons are traveling in opposite direction. Yes or no? These two persons are traveling in opposite direction. You know that when people are traveling in opposite direction, relative speed is, is the sum of the speeds. Yes or no? So let's go by the concept of relative speed. So what happens? In the first hour, Arun covers 8 kilometers, Varun covers 5 kilometers. So total distance covered is 13 hours. In the second hour, Varun, Arun covers 8, this fellow covers 6, 14 kilometers. Yes or no? In the first hour, they cover 13 kilometers. In the second hour, they'll cover 14 kilometers, 15 kilometers and so on. Every hour, their distance covered will increase by 1. Because obviously that fellow's speed is increasing by 1. Now sum of this up to n times should be equal to 112. Now that looks like an arithmetic progression. Apply the formula and get the answer. Right? Let me explain that to you. So what is the other method? Let me now explain the other method to you. Right? So what do we do here is, let me, let me just explain it here on, on this section. Right? I'll use a different color. So, so if you go by relative speed concept, Sorry, just a second. If you go by the concept of relative speed, right, what happens? You know that in the first hour, the distance covered is uh, 8 plus 5, which is 13. In the second hour, the distance covered is 8 plus 6 which is 14 and so on. So basically 13 plus 14 plus 15 plus 16 up to what times? How many times will give you the sum as 112 is a question. 13 kilometers, 14 kilometers, 15 kilometers, 16 kilometers. You keep adding till you get 112 kilometers. Each number here represents one. 
one hour, two hour, this is second hour, this is third hour, fourth hour and so on. So how many hours you will get to know from this. Now this is like an arithmetic progression. You know the formula for arithmetic progression. I mean it's a basic formula. Sum. Sum of n. What is the uh, sum of all the terms in arithmetic progression? S is given as n by 2 into 2a plus n minus 1 into d. Now this is one formula that you have to remember. As such, progressions is not a part of uh, our syllabus, but then this formula would be helpful. Arithmetic progression formula. S is the sum. N is the number of terms. A is the first term. D is the common difference. So the sum of all the terms is given as n by 2 into 2a plus n minus 1 into d. n by 2 into 2a plus n minus 1 into d. You getting it? So you have to now find out what is the value of n. See what is s? s is equal to 1 to 12. So I am using the formula now. Look at the application of the formula here. Here. So s is equal to 1 to 12 equals to n by 2 as it is. 2a. 2 into 13. a is the first term plus n minus 1 as it is and d is the common difference. So common difference between consecutive terms is 1, right? Into 1. Now this will give you an equation, quadratic equation in n. So this 2 goes that side, we will get 224 equals to uh, 13 into 2 is 26. 26n 26 plus n minus 1. Oh sorry, 26n plus n squared minus n. So basically n squared uh, 26n minus n is 25n and minus 224 equals to 0. So solve that quadratic equation you will find that n comes out to be 7. I mean upon solving you will find n is equal to 7. So this is the other way of solving it. I am not solving the quadratic equation for you. It is n squared plus 25n minus 224. Okay. n squared plus 25n minus 224. So when you solve that quadratic equation, you will find that n is equal to 7. Or just use common sense and go by options like what we have done there. Right? Whatever we have followed in the first method is a simple, uh, you know, common logic that every hour they are covering, I mean, Arun is covering 8 and every hour Arun is covering 5, 6, 7 and so on. So, take one of the options, see whether you are getting 112 or not. If you get more than 112, it indicates that answer should be less than that option. If you get less than 112, it indicates that answer should be more than that option. And then you can check it. So, so it's all about playing with numbers. I mean, if you go by that first method, it's just about doing those quick calculations. How to do it by relative speed concept? Anand, I've just explained. Yeah. Uday Kumar and all others that asked that. Clear? I hope all of you are clear with this, right? You just have to remember that formula for sum of all the terms in arithmetic progression, right? n by 2 times of 2a plus n minus 1 into d, where a is the first term, d is the common difference, and n is the number of terms. Let us now move on to the next question. Clear to all of you? Shall I go for the next one? So let's solve all these independent questions first and then we'll move on to the questions on data interpretation and other stuff. Alright, uh, the next question is on your screens here. The digit in the units place of a two digit number is equal to the digit in the tens place of one third of that number and the digit in the tens place of the original number is two less than the digit in the units place of one third of that number. Also, the two-digit number is equal to the equal to the thrice of one third of that number. That's stupid. <laughs> the two-digit number is equal to thrice of one third of that number is like <laughs> nonsense. If the sum of the digits of the original number is six, then what is the number? I think just go by options. This is like a straight question. Don't put pen on paper for writing equations. I mean, you can write equations to solve, but there are multiple conditions given to us for a two-digit number. So just use those conditions and see which option satisfies. For example, look at this. He says the digit in the unit space of a two-digit number is equal to the digit in the tens place of one third of that number. So if you observe, you know, when you had read the question for the first time, you know, two, three times he has mentioned one third of the number, one third of the number and so on. We are talking about a two-digit number. We are talking about a two-digit number. Right? Two-digit number and one third of that two-digit number. So let's say the two-digit number is AB. AB. So we have to take one third of that number, AB by 3. So it's clear that the number has to be a multiple of 3. 
the answer, the two-digit number. Eventually, he's asking us to find out what is the number. That number has to be multiple of three. I'll first check for that. And in one glance, I know that all these options are multiples of three. 15, 24, 33, 42, 51. All are multiples of three. Okay. So that condition doesn't help me eliminate any of the options. But then I'll take one third of the numbers also. Right. What is one third of 15? It is five. One third of 24, eight. One third of 33, 11. One third of 42, 14. One third of 51 is 17. So now I have the two digit numbers and the one third of those numbers. So look at the conditions. The digits in the units place of a two digit number is equal to the digit in the tens place of one third of that number. Now you understand he's talking about tens place of one third of that number. Tens place of one third of that number. Meaning the number that we obtain, one third of the number should also be a two digit number. So immediately option one and option two are eliminated because these numbers do not have a tens place. 5 is a single digit number. 8 is also a single digit number. There is no tens place here. There is no tens place. Hence, the first two options are eliminated straight. Yes or no? Because this is the digit in the units place of the two digit number is equal to the digit in the tens place of the one third of that number. So let's look at the remaining options. What is the digit in the units place here? 3. What is the digit in the tens place of one third of the number? 1. Can this be the answer? No. What is the digit in the units place here? 2. What is the digit in the tens place of one third of the number? 1. Can this be the answer? No. Because it says these two should be same. Look at option 5. The digit in the unit place is 1 of the original number. The digit in the tens place of 1 third of the number is also 1. Does it satisfy the condition? Yes. In fact, this is the only option which satisfies that condition. So it has to be the answer. I don't even have to re read the remaining part of the question. The remaining question is useless in my view. The remaining question is useless because the first statement itself gives us option 5 as the answer by verifying the conditions. Right? So you can straight away leave I mean mark option 5 T1 as the answer however for your clarity let me explain you the remaining conditions as well right in the exam you should stop here option 5 is the answer but let's verify the remaining conditions the digit in the tens place of original number is 2 less than the uh, sorry the digit in the tens place of the original number is 2 less than the digit in the unit place of the one third of the number now what is the digit in the tens place 5 what is that in the original number what is the digit in the unit place of uh, one third of the number 7 is 5 2 less than 7 yes 5 is 2 less than 7 10's place of original number is 2 less than unit place of 1 third of the number. Yes, 5 is 2 less than 7. That condition also is satisfied. Right? This condition is stupid. I mean, this is useless. Also, the 2 digit number is equal to thrice of 1 third of the number. You know what does that condition mean? This means the number is n. He says this number is equal to 3 times of 1 third of the number. Ah, we know that. What is so great about this? How does this help us? He's saying n is equal to 3 into n by 3. Wow. That's like a revelation. We never knew this. Anyway, option 5 is the answer. Let's move on to the next question. Here's the next one. It's on trains. Two trains are running on parallel tracks. The slower train is moving at one, uh, 18 km per hour. The faster train passes a man sitting in the slower train in 52 seconds. Find the time taken by the faster train to overtake the slower one if the lens of the slower and the faster trains are 100 meters and 130 meters respectively. I'm sure it's about using those formulae that we have discussed in cases of trains. Apply and tell me what the answer is. Got it? All right, here we go. Look at this. Two trains are running on parallel tracks. The slower train is moving at 18 km per hour. The faster train passes a man sitting in the slower train in 52 seconds. Find the time taken by the faster train to overtake the slower train. Slower one if the lens of the slower and the faster trains are 100 meters and 130 meters respectively. Now let's look at this, this first case. right? The faster train passes a man sitting in the slower train. So faster train passes a man in slower train. Now we have discussed this in detail in our videos. I'm sure uh, all of you know the concept. I'll just put the formula here. What happens? See, it's about relative speed, right? It's, it's about relative speed. Ha First of all, we need to decide whether the trains are moving in same direction or opposite direction. Now there are two hints given here. Two hints which indicates that the trains are running in the same direction. Yes or no? What is the first hint? The faster train passes a man sitting in the slower train. Remember the word pass is used usually when the bodies are moving in the same direction. 
if they are not in the same direction then you will say cross right moreover if you look at the second uh, part of the statement question find the time taken by the faster train to overtake the slower train overtake again is used only when the trains are moving in the uh, same direction so clearly the trains are moving in same direction so how do we write the equation speed of the first body minus speed of the second body equals to length of the first body plus the length of the second body divided by time this is a general equation this is a general equation right if you know this formula you can solve any question of this topic s1 minus s2 equals to l1 plus l2 by t s1 minus s2 equals to l1 plus l2 by t when the trains are moving in the same direction when they are moving in opposite direction this minus becomes plus now the point is what is the first body here see one indicates the faster train one indicates the faster train and two indicates the man in the slower train man inside slower train be very careful two refers to the man inside the slower train now substitute the values s1 speed of the faster train what is the speed of the faster train acha that we do not know that we do not know so let's let's say speed of the faster train is sf minus speed of the slower train 18 km per hour equals to l1 plus l2 by t what are the lengths of the two trains 100 and 130 right 100 and 130 so 100 plus 130 in fact 130 plus 100 to be very accurate because l1 is a length of the faster train 130 l2 should acha now be careful see s2 is not slower train s2 actually is the man inside the slower train now you can you can as well say that the man is sitting if the man is sitting his speed is zero but he is sitting inside a moving body he is sitting inside a moving body which is moving at 18 km per hour so that is the reason speed of the man was considered as 18 km per hour now l1 is the length of the faster train which is 130 l2 is the length of the man inside the slower train which should be considered as zero remember this should be taken as zero length of the second body should be considered as zero first body is the length of the faster train i mean l1 is length of the faster train 130 l2 is the length of the man which is zero divided by time taken is 52 seconds Uh oh sorry time taken is 52 seconds so this is the equation this is the equation yeah now what happens in the second case so we can we can solve for sf but that is not required i'll tell you how if you observe in the second what is he asking us to find out find out the time taken the faster train to overtake the slower one so in the second case when the faster train see i'm writing so for your clarity all this need not be put on paper faster train overtakes slower one faster train overtakes the slower one in this case what happens the same formula s1 minus s2 equals to l1 plus l2 by t but then s1 is speed of the faster train minus s2 is speed of the slower train equals to l1 plus l2 see what is one in this case one is the faster train what is two in this case the slower train so l1 plus l2 will be 130 plus 100 divided by time is to be calculated t so so if you observe this is equation number 1 and this is equation number 2 instead of solving for what is sf from this one what is sf you can calculate sf from first equation substitute that sf in the second equation to get the time t but instead of doing all that drama let's assume this sf minus 18 which is in both the equations is like speed x so x is equal to 130 by 52 x is equals to 130 plus 100 by t equate those two or or in other words i can say to cover 130 meters to cover 130 meters at this speed we take 52 seconds to cover 130 meters we take 52 seconds to cover 230 meters 100 130 plus 100 is 230 right to cover 230 meters how many seconds will you take cross multiply and you will get the answer are you are you getting the point to cover 130 meters forget about the relative speed and all that that equations were written here those equations were written just to explain the concept where actually you find out the speed of the faster train substitute that in the second equation to get the answer and moreover you have to balance the equation here first of all when you are solving for sf you have to balance the equation because on the left hand side we have units as kilometers per hour on the right hand side we have units as meters and seconds so first you have to convert meters and seconds to kilometers per hour and then only you can use the speed of the faster train but who will do all that not required smart people they will say the faster train covered 130 meters in 52 seconds how much time will it take out to take to cover 230 meters and when you are writing this right you don't have to do all this in the exam let me let me show you whatever i am highlighting here need not be put on paper all this is not required whatever is in red is not required 
smart students will directly put this on paper. They will not worry. They will not be worried about speeds, relative speeds, and all that, because it's about faster train with a relative speed of slower train. 130 meters in 52 seconds. 230 meters in how many seconds? Now how much time will this take? About 10 seconds. So this question looks to be lengthy. Explanation, explanation also initially look lengthy, but that is when you go by the regular process, smart process. This. So your answer will be 230 into 52 by 130. Zeros anyway get cancelled. This goes four times. 23 into 4 is 92. 92 seconds. 92 seconds is there. 92 seconds. Option 3 will be the answer. Take it, take it. So if you are thorough with the concept of this trains and you know uh, man inside a train and stuff like that, right? Relative speed concept. Then you should answer this one in about 10 seconds. Now all I want to understand from you guys is how many of you have solved it in a smart way. Where you just write 130 in 52 seconds, 230 in how many seconds? Cross multiplicate. How many of you have done it in that way? Okay, uh, and, and uh, uh, somebody has pointed out that the answer should be less than 100 seconds. That's again a very smart way, right? I mean, we don't even have to do that cross multiplication in that case. See, if you observe 130 to 230, it's almost double. 130 meters, 230 meters is almost double. So time should also be almost double. 52 into 2, 104. But actually it was less than double, right? 130 is not, 230 is not 130 into 2. It is something less than that. So 52 into 2 will not be the answer. Answer will be less than 52 into 2. What is less than 52 into 2 from the options? 25 and 51 are anyway neglected, ruled out. Answer can either be 92, 104. Answer cannot be, cannot be determined. Right? Answer should be either 92 or 104. 104 is not possible because 104 means 52 into 2. And 52 into 2 means 130 into 2. 260 meters can be covered. But I have to cover less than 260 meters. So the only choice left is option 3. That's even smarter. Yeah? Good. I think whoever has pointed that out. Uh, that, that's even smart. You don't have to do the cross multiplication. Vidya. Vidya, very good. I think 92 is really I mean the process that you follow is really smart now I, I observe that most of you have done it in traditional way right let me see uh, stupid way Neeraj Uday Kumar Dhyanesh Anil Kiran Shubham Murli Sandhya of course followed a smart method Anil did it in a stupid way Vidya Vidya why do you say you have done it in a stupid way you you have done it really smart right Jay Murli and Sony and Yashwishmini and Dipankar. Everybody did it in a normal way. So you know where you have lagged in the exam, right? So next time onwards, don't repeat this mistake. Okay? Let's go back to the next question. Here we go. This is a partnership. Sri and Surya enter into a partnership by investing whatever. After four months, Sri withdraws 2,500 while Surya invests 2,500 more. After four months, Anu joins the business with a capital of 15,000. At the end of the year, the share of profit of Surya exceeds that of Anu by 48,450. What is the profit gained by Surya? So just play with those numbers again. You know what is uh, the situation in partnership, right? The profit is divided based on investments and duration of investments. Alright, <coughs> here we go. Sri and Surya enter into partnership by investing 7,500 and 9,000 respectively. After 4 months, Sri withdraws 5,000 while Surya invests 2,500 more. After 4 months, this should be months, right? After 4 months, Anu joins the business with a capital of 15,000, right? At the end of the year, the share of profit of Surya exceeds that of Anu uh, by 48,450. What is the profit gained by Surya? So there are 3 guys here, Sri, Surya and uh, Anu, right? Sri, Surya and Anu. So, yeah. So, what is the, how, how will you calculate the profits first of all, right? Ratio of their profits. So, Sri is to Surya is to Anu. How do you measure the profit? See, Sri entered with 7,500. But after four months, Sri withdraws 2,500. Meaning for the first four months, his investment was 7,500. And for the remaining 8 months, see, he's, he's talking about end of the year, right? After withdrawing 2,500 here, nowhere else there is any change in Sri's investment. So, meaning in the first 4 months, he invested 7,500. 
But in the remaining 8 months of the year, in the remaining 8 months, his investment was only 5,000. So, you know, because he, he is withdrawn 2,500, right? So, from 7,500, if you subtract 2,500, you will get only 5,000. So, this is what is 3 years invested. Similarly, do it for Surya. He started with 9,000. So, for the first 4 months, it was 9,000. And after 4 months, he invests 2,500 more. He has invested 2,500 more. So, for the remaining 8 months, for the remaining 8 months, how much was his investment? 9,000, 9,000 plus 2,500. 9,000 plus 2,500 is 11,500. Right? And now comes this person, Anu. Now, there's, there's one, uh, <coughs> one point to be noted here. That after 4 months, actually can have different meanings. But here the context is, you know, after 4 months of this change. So basically it's not after 4 months from the beginning. It is after 4 months of the second change. So already there is a change of 4 months in Sri and Surya's investments. And after that, 4 months have passed away. And then Anu joins the business with a capital of 15,000. Right? So basically it means after 4 more months. After 4 more months. Right? Strictly it is like after 4 more months. So basically Anu joins after 8 months. If Anu joins after 8 months, her investment was there only for 4 months. In the last 4 months. And how much was did she invest? 15,000. So basically this is a calculation required. Now at the end of the year, the share of profit of Surya exceeds that of Anu by 48,450. So what is the profit gained by Surya? At the end of 4 months, Surya's profit is 48,450 more than Anu's profit. So what is the profit gained by Surya is the question. Simplify. How do you simplify this? See, first of all, let's, let's, I mean, 4 is common, right? So let's forget about that. 4 into 1, 4 into 2, 4 into 1, 4 into 2, and 4 into 1. Now, I think uh, 2500 is also common everywhere. Or no, 2500 is not common here. Mm. So get the ratio, basically. Get the ratio. So this is... Uh, 2 into 5,000, 10,000, 10,000 plus 7,500 is 17,500 is 2. This is 2 into 11,500. So 23,000, 23,000 plus 9,000 is uh, 32,000. Yes or no? And the last part is 15,000. Now, if you, if you observe the, the, the in, in the question, I mean, look at only... Surya and Anu, right? Because it's all about Surya and Anu. Nowhere is uh, referring to Sri towards the end part of it, right? The profit of Surya exceeds that of Anu by 48,450. So what is the profit gained by Surya? This is the profit ratio that we have got. Sri is to Surya is to Anu. Yeah. So basically, the question says 320 difference 150 is equivalent to 48,450. So 320 will be equal to what? What is this 320, 150 and all that? See, he says profit of Surya exceeds that of Anu by 48,450. According to the ratio, profit of Surya is 320 parts. Profit of Anu is 150 parts. So 320 difference 150 is equal to 48,450. Then 320, 320 will be equal to what? 320 is nothing but the profit of Surya. You understand? This refers to Surya and this refers to Anu. Do the cross multiplication, you get the answer. Do the cross multiplication, you get the answer. <coughs> so 320 and 150, the difference is 170, right? So if 170 is this, 320 is how much? So the question mark should be equal to 320 into 48,450 divided by 170. See, this will be almost two times. If you just observe, this is going to be almost two times because 320 by 170 is close to two, right? Approximately two. 340 by 170, 340 by 170 is exactly 2. 320 by 170 will be slightly less than 2. It will be like 1.9 or something. So close to 2. So answer should be almost double of 48,450. So if it is almost double of 48,450, option 2, option 3 and option 4 are eliminated. Yes or no? Answer should be near to 2 times of 48,450. By that logic, option 2, option 3 and option 4 are eliminated. Either it will be option 1. Or it will be option 5, none of this. Now do the final calculation to get the answer. 
calculation like usual is your lookout. I mean, I think the only way is with this this forty thousand four fifty should get divided by one seventy. So I think seventeen thousand thirty four thousand. Then I can say eight thousand five hundred. So forty two thousand five hundred. Or or if you see fifty one thousand minus how much? I mean this forty thousand four fifty can be taken as fifty one thousand minus something. What is that something? Two thousand five fifty. Two thousand five fifty is almost is two thousand five fifty is one point five times. Yeah. So this is thirty minus one point five. Thirty minus one point five is twenty eight point five. Yeah, so the answer should be three twenty to twenty eight point five. You are able to follow. What I did mentally there was forty eight thousand four fifty is equal to fifty one thousand minus uh, two thousand five fifty because I know that fifty one thousand by one seventy is thirty times. Or, or sorry, two eighty five times. It's three hundred times, and this is uh, fifteen times. Yeah, two eighty five. So this is two eighty five. Three twenty to two eighty five is the answer. You getting it? This is three hundred times. This is fifteen times. So three hundred minus fifteen is two eighty five. So final answer should be three twenty into two eighty five. Verify that you will get option one is answer ninety one thousand two hundred. Okay. It's it's about numbers. You just have to play with those numbers there. Again, I mean, if you ask me how to do calculate, I would say take two eighty five as three hundred minus fifteen. So this will be three twenty into three hundred, which is ninety six thousand minus three twenty into fifteen. Three twenty into fifteen would be uh, four thousand eight hundred. So ninety six thousand minus four thousand eight hundred, ninety one thousand two hundred. We we'll get option minus answer. Clear? It's not something. That you have to skip. I mean, it's not. It, it it is not something that should be skipped in the exam. In my view, I can see two three of you have mentioned that we can skip it. Karan, Karan Martin, Karan only has mentioned that we should skip it. I don't think this should be skipped. It's a it's a it's a simple question. It's just that there are typical calculations there, and here also you can cut down the steps. I mean, it's all about working on those numbers. Uh, there's there's no other shortcut, right? Okay. Uh, oh, there's one more question on time and work. Let's take this. So three questions on time and work in the last paper. A, B, and C can do a piece of work in 14, 28, and 32 days respectively. They all begin together. A works continuously till it is finished. B leaves the work three days before its completion, and C leaves the work two days before its completion. In what time is the work finished? Immediately, what will you do? Let's assume the work takes D days. The total number of days is D. A works continuously till it is finished. So A will work for how many days? D days. At what capacity? One by fourteen, so one by fourteen into D plus B's capacity is one by twenty-eight, but B leaves the work three days before its completion, so into D minus three, and C's capacity is one by thirty-two, but C leaves two days before its completion, so C leaves C works for D minus two days. This is equal to one. Solve for D and you'll get the answer. I'll I'll leave it here. Calculation is your lookout. You getting it? Same concept. One by fourteen, one by twenty-eight, one by thirty-two. Are there capacities? Unit capacities, right? Per day's work. A work for D days, B work for D minus three days, and C work for D minus two days. Capacity multiplied by number of days will give you the work done. Total work done is one unit. Simplify for D. Solve for D basically. Yeah. First of all, I mean, add these two terms. Instead of taking three terms, add these two two terms because denominators have got a common multiple, right? Twenty eight is a common multiple. So if you take instead of taking one by fourteen into D, you take it as two uh, D by twenty eight. Two D by Twenty-eight. So two d plus d minus three, three d minus three. You understand? So it's it's simplified. One one part is simplified immediately. Two d plus d minus three. So three d minus three by twenty-eight plus d minus two by thirty-two equals to one. Huh, now taking common multiple of twenty-eight and thirty-two is going to be a little tricky part, but yeah, you can do that also. Again, if required, take one by four common here. This becomes seven. This becomes eight. Fifty-six is the common multiple. Yeah. So you can do the calculation. D will be the answer. In what time is the work finished? The work is finished in D days. So that can be done, right? Uh, should we take up the next one? Next question. Try this. 
a man borrowed 24,000 from two persons. He paid 8% interest per annum to one and 12% interest per annum to the other. After three years, he paid a total interest of 6,960. How much did he borrow at each rate? Now, this is a simple question and yes, it belongs to simple interest case. How do I know it belongs to simple interest case? Like I have always mentioned, if nothing is specified explicitly in the question, take it as simple interest. Yes or no? A man borrowed 24,000 from two persons. He paid 8% per annum to one and 12% per annum to the other. So basically, total what he borrowed is 24,000. So I can say P1 plus P2, principal of first person plus principal from second person is equal to 24,000. He's paying 8% to the first person, 12% to the second person per annum. After three years, he paid a total interest of 6,960. Now the simple point is, if he's paying 8% every year, how much will he pay in three years? 24%. 24% of what? P1. Similarly, if he's paying 12% per year, how much will he pay in 3 years? 12 into 3, 36%. 36% of what? P2. So 24% of P1 plus 36% of P2 is equal to 6960. Two equations and two variables. Solve and you will get the answer. Two equations and two variables. Solve and you will get the answer. But then there are other verifications that can be done. I mean, since he is asking us to find out how much did he borrow from each person, you know that total should be 24,000. So 16,000, 8,000 is 24,000. Just check that. 20 and 4,000, 24,000. This is also 24,000. This is also 20. So these options satisfy. Uh, then if you if you don't want to solve the two equations, maybe you can take percentages. You take 24 percentage of 16,000 and 36 percentage of 8,000. The total should be 6,960. If yes, that's the answer. Otherwise, go to the next option. But I think that verification is going to take time. So you better solve the... You understand? Verifying 24% uh, of 16,000 plus 36% of 8,000 and adding it to 6,960, yes or no, will take time. Similarly, 24% uh, of 20,000 plus 36% of 4,000, again, too much of calculation, right? In each, each option, you have to do 2-3 calculations. So, you better solve the two equations. Solving equations is not very difficult. Or, we have discussed in our videos, in our allegations and mixtures videos, that this question can also be solved using allegation rule. Right? So this is one way. Solve for P1 and P2, you'll get the answer. Solve for P1 and P2 from the two equations. You'll get the answer. Let me explain the other method, the smart method. Allegation rule. Allegation rule. What is allegation rule? See, allegation rule goes as follows. I mean, you can refer to the video directly. The miscellaneous videos from allegation, you will find out the detailed process. It, it works as follows. Let's assume the whole amount was... Uh, the whole amount was, see first of all find out 6960 is what percentage of 24,000. For allegation rule to be applicable, you, you should know 6960 is what percentage of 24,000. So 6960 divided by 24,000 into 100, right? So basically 696 by 24. So how much will that be? That's like 720 minus 24, right? It is 29 percentage. Right, 29 percentage. Meaning overall interest, total interest. 29 percentage is nothing but the total interest from both the schemes together. Right? Now how the allegation rule works? Let's assume the whole amount was borrowed at 8 percentage. So how much interest will you get? 24 percentage. Let's assume the whole amount was borrowed at 12 percentage. How much interest will you get? 36 percentage. But in the mixture where some amount was borrowed at 8 percentage and the remaining amount was borrowed at 12 percentage, we got effective 29 percentage to the cross difference. 36 difference 29 is 7 percentage. 24 difference 29 is 5 percentage. So the ratio is 7 is to 5. This 7 is to 5 actually indicates P1 is to P2 ratio. So basically P1 by P2 should be equal to 7 by 5. So divide 24,000 into this ratio. So basically 7 and 5 are 12 parts, right? 24,000 in 12 parts meaning each part will be 2,000. So 7 parts is 14,000. And 5 parts is 10,000. I am sure some of you who are new to the system may not follow this method. Don't panic. Don't worry. Don't get scared. It's a simple method. It is appearing to be complex because you are learning it for the first time. right? Go watch the videos and allegations and mixtures. It's a very interesting way of solving questions where you are mixing varieties. So that's what we are doing here. right? We have got two different amounts. Interest from one amount, interest from the other amount, interest from both amounts together. It's like a mixture. To apply allegation. Okay. Next question. Profit and loss. Try this out. 
marked price of two articles is 3600 each one is sold at a discount of 15% and the other at discount of 5% if the net profit is 25% each and their cost prices are in the ratio 3 is to 1 find the cost price of the articles I think what I would immediately do is take the verification of cost prices, right? The cost prices are in the ratio of 3 to 1, he says, right? See which options are in the ratio of 3 to 1. Because in all the options, uh, we have different numbers. Maybe multiple options satisfy, then you can do something about it. All right, let's take it up. Marked price of two articles is rupees 3000 each. So M1 is equal to 3600. M2 is also equal to 3600. One is sold at a discount of 15% and the other is sold at a discount of 5%. So D1 is equal to 15%, D2 is equal to 5% discount percentages. If the net profit is 25% and their cost prices are in the ratio of 3 is to 1, find the cost prices of the articles. What else do we know? C1 is to C2. C1 is to C2 is equal to 3 is to 1. The cost prices should be in the ratio of 3 is to 1. And the net profit, profit, total profit is... 25 percentage now when you know the market price and discount can you find out the selling prices yes so we can find out the selling prices of each of the articles then once you know the selling prices of each of the articles can you find out the total selling price yes once you know the total selling price and the total profit can you find out the total cost price yes once you know the total cost price and you know the cost price ratio can you find out the individual cost prices yes so that is a step-by-step -step process getting it get s1 get s2 get total selling price from total selling price and total profit get the total cost price then divide the total cost price in the ratio of 3 is to 1 to get the individual cost prices but before we do that why don't we eliminate some options and maybe if all the options get eliminated I mean of course there is a risk here that the fifth option is none of this so you may not want to eliminate the options because you know you may eventually be left with that confusion towards the end but however some quick eliminations can be done for example See, I know that this is C1, this is C2, this is C1, this is C2, this is C1, C2, and so on. C1, C2, and so on. If you see, the ratio is 3 is to 1. So we know that C1 should be 3 times of C2. Yes or no? What does it mean? C1 should be equal to 3 C2. C1 should be equal to 3 C2. Now, if I multiply 1296 with 3, see, this number is ending in 6. When a number ends in 6, and you multiply it with 3, the answer should end with 8. But then this option is ending in 4. So this cannot be the answer. Huh. 6 into 3, 8, yes. 6 into 3, 8, yes. 6 into 3, 8, yes. So remaining option satisfies us. That doesn't really help. I mean, this is a quick verification. It won't take one minute to do. I'm just explaining that one option is eliminated. But then simple understanding. You see 1266 into 3. Does it give you 3888? No. Because 1200 into 3 is 3600. And 66 into 3 will be 198. 3600 plus 198 is... 3,798. You're getting it. C2 into C3. C2 into 3. What we are doing is C2 into 3. So 1200 into 3, 66 into 3. 3,600 plus 198 is 3,798. But what we have here is 3,888. Cannot be the answer. 1296 into 3. What is 1296 into 3? We have already got this. Uh, no, we have not got this. 1296 into 3, uh, 3,600. And 96 into 3 will be 270 plus 18, 288. So 3,888. Now this is 3,848. Can this be the answer? No. 1296 into 3. Yeah, 3,888. So option 4 or fifth option, none of this. So even if you are, let's say you are doing this in the last 5-10 seconds of the exam. Or last half minute of the exam. You should, you should know that this is the best condition to verify maybe. If, if that strikes you, immediately 3 options get eliminated. Because this is not a multiple of 3 at all. It does not satisfy the unit digit method. And these two are wrong. 1266 into 3 is not 3888. 1296 into 3 is not 3848. So either fourth option which satisfies that condition or fifth option. Matters. Now that you are left with only one option, you can play with numbers on this option as well. And check. And check. How do you do that? Uh, <coughs> yeah, I think now also nothing can be done because options... Uh, these are cost prices. There is no condition on cost price other than C1 is to C2 equals to 3 is to 1. Maybe you can find out the total cost price, take 25% profit and find out that total selling price to see if it is matching or not. But then, yeah, what I was trying to explain is how to eliminate options. Some options can be eliminated.
The process I have explained. S1 will be how much? See, discount is 15 percentage, right? So selling price will be only 85 percentage. 85 percentage of 3,600. Uh, S2 will be uh, 95 percentage of 3,600. Don't ask me why. 5 percent discount, so 95 percentage. 15 percent discount, so 85 percentage. What is total S1 plus S2? See, both are percentage of 3,600, right? So I can take 3,600 common. 95 percentage plus 85 percentage is 180 percentage. 180 percentage of 3600 so that should be uh, 7200 minus 720 which is 7000 minus 520 which is 6480 so total selling price is 6480 and the profit is 25 percentage so what should be the total cost price total selling price s is equal to this what should be the cost price cost price should be 100 by 125 see profit is 25 percentage right meaning 125 percentage is 6480 this is 125 percentage. So if 125 percentage is 6,480, 100 percentage is equal to what? Cross multiply. So you will get, so basically 4 by 5, 4 by 5 times of 6,480. So 4 by 5 of 6,000 is 4,800. 4 by 5 of 480. Are you getting it? Just, just do this calculation. 4 fifth of 6000, 4800, 4 fifth of 480 divided into 5 parts. Uh, 80, 96, 96 into 4, 96 into 4 will be 384. Yeah? So that will be 4800 plus 384, 5184. Total cost price should be 5184. Now divide 5184 in this ratio, 3 is to 1 ratio. I mean, we have done the whole solution. We have done the whole solution, but uh, yeah. Now, now you can check also. If if three triple eight plus one two nine six is adding up to five one eight four, this can be taken as answer because it satisfies the ratio condition. It also satisfies the total cost price condition. If that doesn't satisfy, then option five is not this answer. Add three thousand triple eight plus twelve ninety six. So three thousand eight hundred plus twelve hundred is five thousand. Eighty eight and ninety six is one eighty four. Five thousand one eighty four. Yes, option four is the answer. Or now that you have done all these steps, anyway, you can divide 5184 in this ratio. 3 to 1 ratio, you will get option 4. So clearly, I think you have to be like good with numbers to be able to solve these questions quickly, right? The concept is the same. Selling price is equal to cost price plus profit. Selling price is equal to mark price minus discount. There is no change in the concept. There is no new shortcut formula. There is no smarter or a better formula. The only thing that can work in your favor is your numerical skills. So I think moral of the story is practice on numbers, more and more on numbers. Okay, should we move on? Okay, the last question from this independent ones. Mm -hmm. A field can be plowed in 16 days. If 18 more hectares of land is plowed daily, the work will be finished in 10 days. Find the area of the field. Interesting. Find out. You can do the work in 16 days. But if you do additional 18 hectares per day, you can do it in 10 days. So a field can be plowed in 16 days. If 18 more hectares of land is plowed daily, the work will be finished in 10 days. Find the area of the field. Find the area of the field. Now, let's assume that the area of the field is equal to A. A hectares right if you can do a hectares in uh, 16 days what is per day what is the work done in per day work per day it is a by 16 per day yes or no that is what you have usually do that is what you usually do right total area is a hectares if you can finish it in 16 days per day you are doing a by, a, a by 16 but then he says if 18 more hectares of the land is plot daily the work will be done in 10 days so try and understand. A by 16 is what I am usually doing. But if I do 18 more per day. So A by 16 plus 18. Then I will be able to do the total area in just 10 days. Are you getting it? A by 16 is per day's work. Original per day's work. But then now I am doing 18 extra. So A by 16 plus 18 will be helping me finish the total work in 10 days. Now, this is what total is. So, this should be equal to A. <coughs> okay, let me 
Do that now. So what happens? Uh, uh, we get ten uh, a plus c. This is sixteen into eighteen. What is sixteen into eighteen? <coughs> sixteen into eighteen. Uh, this is like seventeen plus one, seventeen minus one, right? I mean, it's like a plus b into a minus b. Seventeen squared minus one squared. What is seventeen squared? Two eighty nine minus one, two eighty eight. So two eighty eight into ten, two thousand eight eighty equals to sixteen a. So basically, six a equals to two thousand eight eighty. A is equal to what? So a will be equal to two thousand eight eighty divided by six. Simplify this. This will be four eighty. That's your answer. Option three. Now, one idea initially is you know the field. He said the field can be plotted in sixteen days, right? So the total area should be a multiple of sixteen. That way, if you want to eliminate, four uh, twenty can be eliminated, five twenty can also be eliminated. But four eighty and four hundred both are multiples of sixteen. And moreover, fifth option none of this is there. So you will have to do the calculation. But only one equation. This is one equation that you have to use. A by sixteen plus eighteen into ten is equal to a. Okay, clear to all of you. Yeah, multiple of sixteen is the right idea. All those who have picked up multiple of sixteen is the right idea. But the challenge, guys, is there are three options which are multiples of sixteen. Four eighty is a multiple of sixteen. Four hundred is also a multiple of sixteen. And none of this is a multiple of sixteen. Maybe then you can pick up one option and verify the other condition. Like for example, four eighty. So if you do in sixteen days per day, you are doing thirty. If you do eighteen more, so thirty plus eighteen, four eighty, uh, forty eight, forty eight in ten days, four eighty. Satisfied. So that is the answer. That can be done. Yeah. Clear to all of you. Anand Kumar says a into sixteen equals to a plus. No, that's wrong. Anand, a into sixteen equals to a plus eighteen into ten is wrong because it is a plus eighteen into sixteen into ten. So we go for the next one now. Okay. Now we have. I think data interpretation number C. So as usual, there's no, nothing to be discussed there. So let's let's take up this question on data interpretation. Look at the data. Study the following graph carefully and answer the questions given below. The table shows the total population and the percentage of male in five different cities. Now, some some data is missing here, but very simple uh, data, right? A, B, C, D, E are the five cities. Their total population is given here: twenty-four thousand missing value, forty thousand, fifty thousand missing value, and percentage of male population is given. Missing value: sixty percent missing, missing forty percent. So, if percentage of male is sixty, it's obvious that female will be forty. See, indirectly we know that female population is going to be forty percent here. In this case, female population is going to be sixty percent, right? So so let's move to the questions. Yeah, here are the questions. Look at this. Find the total number of males in city E if the number of females in city E is same as the number of females in city A, and the percentage of males in city A is fifty percent. Okay. So he's asking us to find out the total number of males in city E. So this is equal to what? Percentage is known to us, but what's the actual value? Is the question. Find the total number of males in city e. if the number of females in city E. Is same as the number of females in city A, and the percentage of males in city A is fifty percent. See, he says percentage of males in city A is fifty. So implies females is also fifty. If males is fifty, females also fifty. Fifty percent of what? Twenty-four thousand, which is twelve thousand. Now look at the second part of the question. The number of females in city E is same as the number of females in city A. Number of females in city E same as number of females in city A. So if females in city A is how much? Twelve thousand, which is equal to females in city E. Now I know that if forty percent are males in city A, how many are females in city A? Forty uh, percent are females in city E. How many are females in city E? Sixty percent. Sixty percent of total. Sixty percent of E. Let's say. You getting it? Forty percent are males. So females in city E will be sixty percent. Sixty percent of its total population. But that is equal to twelve thousand. Yes or no? Females in city E is twelve thousand because females in city E is equal to females in city A. We know that females in city E is sixty percent. So indirectly, what is given here is uh, now now he is asking us to find out the total number of males in city. E. So sixty percentage is equal to twelve thousand. 
40 percentage is equal to what? 40 percentage of E is equal to what? Cross multiply and get the answer. Males in E. Males in E is 40 percentage. So 60 is 12,000, 40 is 8,000. That calculation you need not do on paper, right? If 60 percentage is equivalent to 12,000, 40 percent you know will be 8,000. Straight question. Option 2. Next one. What is the ratio between number of females in city A and number of females in city D if percentage of males in city A and D is 50% and 70% respectively? So data is given. Percentage of males in city A and D is 50 and 70 respectively. So 50% and 70%. He's asking us to get the ratio between females in A and females in D. So females of A is to females of D. That's a sitter, right? It will be 50% of 24,000 is to females of D will be 30% of 50,000. Simplify this. 50% of 24 is 12. 30% of 50 is 15. 12 is to 15 or 4 is to 5. Option 4. Find the number of females in E if the total population in E is half of city C. Total population of E is half of C. Total population of C is 40,000, so this is 20,000. Number of females in E, 60%. Males are 40, so females will be 60. 60% 60 of 20,000 is 12,000. Option 1. Find the total number of females in B and E if the total population for all the cities together is 1,70,000 and the ratio of population in city C to E is 2 is to 1. So what does it say? Po total population of all the cities is 1,70,000. This is 1,70,000 total population okay one lakh seventy thousand and the ratio of population in c to e is two is to one c to e is two is to one meaning if c is forty thousand which is two parts e will be one part twenty thousand now can you find out the total population of b yes because overall total is given to us twenty four thousand plus forty sixty four thousand sixty four thousand plus fifty thousand one lakh fourteen thousand one lakh fourteen thousand plus twenty thousand is one lakh thirty four thousand one lakh thirty four thousand so, 1,70,000 like minus 1,34,000 like is 36,000. You get it? 60, 1 lakh, 1 lakh, yeah. 1 lakh, 70. So, we now know the population of all the cities from the given data. What is he asking us to find out? Total number of females in B and E. Females in B and E. Females in B and E will be what? 40% of 36 plus 60% of 36. Females he said. So, males is 60 meaning females will be 40. Males is 40 meaning females will be 60. 60% of 20. So 40% of 36 is how much? 14.4. Uh, 14.4 plus 60% of 20 is 12. So this is like 26.4 thousand. Remember all these are in thousands. 36,000, 20,000. So 26,400. 26.4 thousand is 26,400. Option 3. This one. Total population in A and C together is approximately what percentage more or less than the total population in C and D together? A and C together. Total of A and C is how much? 24 and 40, 64. Is approximately what percentage more or less? What percentage more or less? Then the total population of C and D together. What is C and D together? C and D together is 90. Sorry, 90. So 64 is what percentage more or less than 90? So 64 minus 90 divided by 90 into 100. Do the calculation. 64 minus 90 is 26, right? 26 by 90 into 100. So this close to 30 percentage, right? See, 27 by 90 will be 30 percentage. So just about 30 percentage. Slightly less than 30 percentage. Option 5 will be the answer. Simple calculation. Yeah. So I think you, you should solve these five questions in about two minutes in the exam, right? Very, very straight calculations and no complexity in the data also, right? Total population, percentage of male, percentage of female. There is the matter. Okay, there's one more data interpretation question on table. Uh, there's another table, uh, DI table. Let's take that. I'll first leave you with this data. Try to study this. Understood the data? Very simple. What does it say? Study the following table carefully to answer the questions given below. That's the usual stuff. Percentage of marks obtained by seven students in six subjects. Oh, so a lot of data. And this data is about percentage of marks obtained by seven students. Who are the seven students? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 
EFG, sorry, EFG, right? So when students in six subjects, the subjects are English, History, Computer, Math, Science, Total, Social. And these are all percentages, remember, all these are percentages of marks, percentages. M indicates maximum marks. So, maximum in 60, English is 60, maximum in History is 40. So, suppose you have to find out how many marks did C score in History, 70% of 40, 28 marks. How many marks did D score in Computer, 65% of 130. Do that calculation, right? Similarly, how many marks did F score in, uh, let's say, Math, 70% of 150. Do that calculation. So, so percentages are given. You just have to find out the actual marks, wherever required. Look at this now. What is the average marks obtained by these seven students in history? Average marks obtained by these seven students in history. Now, let me tell you one thing. To find out the average marks of history, you don't have to actually calculate the individual marks first and then take the average. Instead, take the average percentage first. See, finding out 80% of 40, 70% of 40, 70% of 40, 60% of 40, 90% of 40 and so on. It's easy actually. 80% of 40, 32, 28, 28, 24, 36, 24, 32. It's there. And then you can take the average. But instead, take the average of percentages. Here, maybe the percentages are same. But in the, let's say in other case, if the percentages are different and typical, then finding out individual percentages would be a waste of time. So first, find out the average percentage. First, find out the average percentage. Get the average percentage. 80 plus 70, 150. Plus 70, 220. Plus 60, 280. Plus 90, 370. Plus 60, 430. Plus 80, 510. Right? 510. 510 by 7. So average is equal to 510 percentage by 7. Average marks will be 510 percentage by 7 into marks 40. I mean this much percentage. This much percentage of 40 is the average marks. You getting it? Do that calculation. I mean calculation of course as usual is your lookout. This is very close to 70% of 40. Slightly more than 70%. So it's, it's, I mean if I say this is approximately see you understand 510 percentage by 7 is approximately 70 percentage. Approximately 70 or 490 plus 20 right approximately 73 percentage 73 percentage of 40 because 510 i am breaking it as 490 percentage plus 20 percentage so 490 percent by 7 is 70 percentage 20 percentage by 7 is 3 percentage 20 percent uh, you understand 490 by 7 is 70 20 by 7 is 3 70 plus 3 70 73 percentage of 40 what will be 73 percentage of 40 70 percent of 40 is 28 3 percentage of 40 is 1 point so 29.2 29.2 somewhere around 29.2 which is option 3 okay. clearly 1, 2, 4 are not the answers you can maybe say strictly 5th option and all this, but do the precise calculation I have done an approximate calculation when you do the actual calculation it comes out to be slightly less than 29.2 slightly less than 29.2 because this is not 21 percentage, right? this is 20 percentage. So answer will be slightly less than 73 percentage. Option 3 satisfies. Next one. What is the overall percentage of C? What is the overall percentage of C? Now remember, the, from, with respect to the previous case, what is the difference? This time, you cannot take the total percentage of C. In the previous case, we took the total percentage of history and took the average. But for C, overall average, overall percentage of C or average marks of C, you cannot take... You cannot add these percentages. Why can't you add these percentages horizontally? We can add vertically, but we cannot add horizontally. Why? Because every percentage is for a different value. This is 90% of 60. This is 70% of 40. This is 60% of 130. This is 90% of 150. 70% of 120. Getting it? So every percentage is for a different value. Hence, you cannot add the percentages directly. Right? So what do you have to do? Find out the total marks. Divide by the total maximum marks to get the answer. Okay, so let's let's do that. Now, now it's it's about calculations, right? I mean, ninety percent of sixty, so fifty-four. Let me do one thing. I'll I'll write the numbers there itself, right? So that you can follow. Now we are working on C basically. C ninety percent of sixty is fifty-four. Seventy percent of forty twenty-eight. Sixty percent of one thirty. How much will that be? It will be 70, 78 again, right? 70, sorry, 78. Then 90% of 150 will be 135. 70% of 
120 will be 84 and 70 percent of 80 will be 56. The find the total marks of C 54 and 56 is 110 then or add 100 add tens and then add unit places for easier calculation so 50 plus 20 70 plus 70 140 plus 132 70 plus 80 350 plus 50 400 and then this is 12 20 25 29 35 435 so 435 marks you getting it 70 140 270 350 400 and then this is 12 20 25 30 Oh, sorry hold on 12 20 25 yeah and 10 35 yeah 435 435 divided by total maximum marks you have to take the total of maximum marks also only then you'll get the overall percentage so 60 40 100 plus 130 230 230 plus 150 is 380 380 plus 120 is 500 500 plus 80 is 580 so 435 by 580 into 100 435 by 580 into 100. Do the calculation. Now the calculation is your lookout. Do that calculation. <coughs> don't don't say zero zero cancelled. Not that type of calculation, right? Or don't take five common and waste your time. All those who have done five common, so 435 by 5 and 585 by 5 are all wasting their time. You should be smart enough to split the numerator in terms of the denominator to get the answer. Like, like mm -hmm. for example, I'll say 435 is, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll split 435 as follows, you see. Let me, let me write it here so that you can follow. 435 in my view is equal to uh, 290 plus 58 into 2 is 116, right? It still goes 116 plus so 290 plus 116 is how much? 300, 406, 406 and 29. Yes. So I am splitting 435 as 290 plus 116 plus 29. I'll tell you why did I break this like, break like this. Because I know 290 is 50 percentage of 580. My base is 580. 100 percentage is 580. So 290 is 50 percent. 116 is 20 percent. And 29 is 5 percent. So 50 plus 20 plus 5. 70 plus 5, 75 percentage. Option 1 will be the answer. Next question. In which subject is the overall percentage the best? Ha, this is interesting. In which subject is the overall percentage the best? In which subject is the overall percentage the best? So whatever we had done for question number one here, right? We have found the overall percentage. Remember 5, 10 by 7 for history. We had to find out the average marks of history. We found overall percentage. What did we do? We take the average of percentages. So likewise, you have to do for all the subjects, each one of the subjects. And then check in which subject is overall percentage best. Remember, don't you don't have to do the calculation of marks. It, it only, you don't have to consider 60, 40, 130 and so on. Because he's only asking in which subject is the overall percentage best. So take the average percentage. Average of these values. Average of these values. Average of these values. So seven averages have to be calculated and then whichever is the best is your answer. Visually you can tell then nothing like it otherwise achha, don't you don't have to do it for all the six subjects by the way you don't have to do it for all the six subjects because in options we have only five history social math science achha, none of this is there huh? smart people they have given none of this so we have to do it for all the six subjects you understand so it's a time consuming process if i am writing the exam i'll skip it if I'm writing the exam, I'll skip this question because I have to find out the average of these values, average of these values, and then these values, and these values, and these values, and these values, and then compare which is the best. Now, strictly speaking, you need not calculate average. You can just end up at total also because everything is getting divided by 7, right? Average of these values meaning what? Total of these values by 7. Total of these values by 7. Total of these values by 7 by 7 by 7 by 7. So since denominator is common everywhere, you can skip it. You can, you can neglect it. But even then, you have to find out the sum of all the values. You have to do six sums. Whichever sum is highest, that subject is the answer. You getting it? Whichever, whichever subject is highest, whichever subject has got highest sum, that can be taken as the answer. Yeah? Sometimes it is 
possible to answer such questions by observation, but you need to have that kind of an observation. And even then it will take like around 45 seconds and so on. So, so what, what do we do? Should I solve it? I mean, I'm going to skip it in the exam, but here I'll solve. What will I do? I'll simply take the total of all the values. Find out the six totals. Uh, so do that. 180, 270, 330, 380, 420, 500. 150, 220, 280, 370, 330, and 80, 410. Why is it so less? 410 only? 410 or 510, sorry. 150, 220, 280, 370, 410. I'm sorry, this is 510. Be careful. <coughs> then uh, 50 plus 80, 130, 130 plus 60. 190, 190 plus 65, 255, 255 plus 62 is 317, 317 plus 64 is 381, 381 plus 35. Anyway, it's going to be less than 500, so forget about it. You see, I've already got 510 as the highest, right? So anything which is appearing to be less than 500 can be neglected. This is not even reaching 400, so forget about it. So that's the advantage. This this method was discussed in our videos also. If you watch percentages videos, I have explained you this method. I have got a benchmark of 510. So far, my highest is 510. So immediately English is ruled out. If English is there in the options, it is ruled out. Computer is also ruled out. But these fellows have not given both the options, you see. English and computer both are not given. I am looking at 510 as a benchmark. So anything which is appearing to be less than 510, just neglect it. Don't do precise calculation. Now this is 90 plus 100, 190. 190 plus 90, 280 plus 80. 360 plus 80, uh, 440, 440 plus 70, 510, 510 plus 65, 575. So now this is ruled out, history is ruled out because now my benchmark is 575. This clearly is not going to be 575. You see 60, 40, 100, 170 is uh, 170, this is 250, this is 345, this is 345 plus 85, 345 plus 85 is or 345 plus 160 it's going to be 5 not 5 so social also cannot be the answer right it should be between math and science check for science now 90 and 80 is 170 170 and 70 is 240 and 80 is 320 and uh, this is 150 so 470 470 plus 50 is 520 math is the highest so math is the answer Okay, so I mean, if you do calculation, some each sum would take about let's say 10 seconds. So six sums will take about 60 seconds, so not more than one minute. You should be smart enough to avoid some of the calculations. I mean, that that gauging you must have, that that sense you must have. What is the total marks obtained by A in all the subjects? I think you know what to do, right? Total marks obtained by A in all the subjects. Find the marks of A. 60, 80 percent of 40, 32. This is 65, this is 135, this is 108, this is 48. Find out the total, total marks. Uh, will it end in 0? It won't end in 0, you see, because uh, it will end in 8. Answer should end with 8. So option 2, option 3 and option 4 are eliminated. But again, smart fellow, he has given 5th option and none of this. So we have to do the total. But if by any chance 5th option also is not ending in 8, you can eliminate that and mark option 1 as the answer. Because 0, 5 and 5 is 0 and 8 and 2 is 0. Answer should end with 8 in my view. I mean, it should end in 8 by unit region method. Now quickly verify. 60 plus 32, 92. 92 plus 65 is 157. 157 plus 135 will be 292. 292 plus 108 will be 400. Plus 48 will be 448. Option 1 is the answer. How quickly you do that is what matters, right? I mean, I'm sure all of you can solve it, but how quickly do you solve is the question. How many students have got 60 percentage or more marks in all the subjects? How many students have got 60 percentage or more marks in all the subjects? Okay, now this is interesting. How do you solve this? How many students have got 60 percentage or more marks in all the subjects? They should be getting 60 percentage or more. Now I'll tell you how to solve this. We know the maximum marks of each subject. So let us find out what will be 60 percentage cutoff for each subject. So 60 percentage for English will be 36. So anybody who scores greater than 36 has got more than 60 percentage marks. 60 percentage of 40 will be 24. 60 percentage of 130 will be 78. 
60 percentage of 150 will be 90. 60 percentage of 120 will be 72. And 60 percentage of 80 will be 48. Meaning, anybody who's got more than 36 in English has got more than 60 percentage. Anybody who's got more than 30, 24 in history has got more than... Achha, hold on. All the percentages are given, right? I am wasting our time. Sorry. We don't have to do this cutoff. This cutoff would be required if actual marks are given. But here, actual marks are Here, percentages are only given, right? So it's a simple observation based case. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I thought, I mean, I was under an impression that these are all marks. So if these are actual marks, then you'll have to do this calculation. And then see how many people have got more than that in all the subjects. But here we can directly compare. 60 percentage or more in all the subjects. So A. A has got 50 percentage in computer. So A is eliminated. You understand? He's got less than 50, 60 percentage. B has got... 40 percentage here, B is gone. C has got, yes, C has got 60 percentage or more in all the subjects. D has got 60 percentage or more in all the subjects. E has got less than 60 here, so eliminated. F has got less than 60 here, eliminated. E has got 35 eliminated. So C and D are the only two persons. So how many students have got more than 60 percentage marks? Two students. Right? So that is done. Very simple. Very, very simple. Percentage of marks are given. You have to just check how many have got 60% more in all the subjects. If actual marks are given, then the step, useless step which I did was to be done, was to be followed. <coughs> so I think data interpretation is done, number series, I'm sure, solutions we have. Now, what do you want me to solve? Anything else? There are questions on data sufficiency. Do you want me to take those questions? Let me see how complex are these questions. A man purchased a camera and sold it. What is the selling price of the camera? He marks up by 20% then the cost price and marked price of the camera is 4,500. He allows two successive discounts of and earns 120 more than the single. He allows two successive discounts, earns 120 more than the single discount. What is the speed of the train? Find the area of the floor. Should we take up these data sufficiency questions? Let's take up. So the first one, first one is on your screens here. Solve that. Data sufficiency. Don't waste your time in doing the full calculation. Because you don't have to solve and get the answer. All you have to check is, will you get the answer? Got it? <laughs> Alright. Here's the first one. See what it says. So basically data sufficiency, it says in each of the following questions, a question followed by two statements numbered one and two are given. You have to read both the statements and then give the answer as per the following options. So data in one alone is sufficient, data in two alone is sufficient, data in either one or two is sufficient, data in both one and two together are not sufficient, and data in both one and two together are necessary. So standard options, A, B, C, D, E here are standard options. So let's look at this question here. A man purchased a camera and sold it. What is the selling price of the camera? So basically it says S is equal to what? Look at the first statement. He marks up by 20% in the cost price and the mark price of the camera is 4,500. Now, all I know here is mark the price is equal to 120% of cost price and cost price is equal to 4,500. But the question is, will I get selling price from these two? No. I can find out the mark price. I know the Sorry, and, and mark price of the camera is 4,500. I, I can, mark price is given, 4,500. And we know that mark price is 20% more than the cost price. So I can find out the cost price also. But will I get the selling price? No. So statement one alone is not sufficient. Yes or no? One alone is not sufficient. Look at statement two. He allows two successive discounts, earns 120 more than the single discount. Now he allows two successive discounts is fine. But what percentages? We do not know. He earns 120 more than the single discount. So profit is 120. But what is the discount? Unless we know the discount, we cannot do anything about it, right? All we know here is profit is equal to 120 more than discount. So profit will be 120 more than the discount value. But one equation with two variables. Can you solve? Can you, can you find out what is the profit? No. Can you find out what is the discount here? No. So this is useless statement. And even if you combine both the statements together, what will you get? You will get nothing. I know selling price. For me to find out the selling price, I should know the marked price and discount. 
but that discount is not given or i should know the cost price and profit but that profit is not given so even the combination will not lead to anything so our answer should be option 4 data given in both the statements 1 and 2 are not sufficient to answer the question d right both 1 and 2 will not be sufficient look at the next one what is the speed of the train in kilometers per hour now statement 1 the train crosses a platform of length 150 meters in 20 seconds and a pole in 5 seconds while traveling at the same speed can you find out the answer? Yes, we can find out the answer. By looking at the statement itself, you should know that one alone is sufficient. Two we have not checked, but one is sufficient. Why? See, we know that while crossing the pole, it, it travels its own length. So to travel its own length, it takes 5 seconds. To travel its own length plus 150 meters, it takes 20 seconds. So I can find out the speed of the train. I mean, I can write two equations in two variables. You understand? Two equations in two variables. Basically... See, I know that I can get the answer. I'm sure many of you must have understood that already. But for those who have not been able to follow, let me tell you what is happening in my head now. Or what should ideally happen in your head in the exam. You should figure out that two equations can be framed in two variables. One of those variables is speed and hence one alone is sufficient. What are the two equations? It's like this. Speed of the train. Or, or by the way, it's simple. Not even two equations in fact. First equation itself is sufficient, right? Length is given. Time is given. Can you not find out the speed of the train? Will be 150 by 5. Because you know that when the train is crossing a pole, when the train is crossing a pole, it has to cover its own length. It has to travel its own length. So train covers 150 meters in 5 seconds. Which means I know the speed. Now don't waste your time in saying 30 meters per second. It's a waste of time. Because actual answer is not required. What is required is, will we get the answer or not? Yes. One alone will give the answer. Two alone. 150 meter in length passes a person running at a speed of 3.5 meters per second in opposite direction 12 seconds. Yes, I know the speed of the person. I know the length of the first body. The length of the second body should be zero. I know they are traveling in same direction. So the relative speed will be difference of speed. I know the time taken. Can I get the speed? Yes. What will be the equation looking like? Speed of the train minus 3.5 meters per second should be equal to 150 plus zero divided by 12. One equation, one variable I can solve. So, one alone gives me the answer, two alone also gives me the answer. Hence, option C. Either one alone or two alone will give us the answer. Next one. What is the area of the floor? To find out the area of the floor, why should you know what is length and what is breadth? L into B is equal to what? The question is, what is L into B? So, all you have to check for is, what is length and the what is breadth? Statement 1. If the height of the room is 6 meters, the length is twice its breadth. If the height is 6 meters. If the height of the room is 6 meters, then the length is twice its, twice its breadth. Will this give us the answer? No. Because that's like a condition. That's like a condition that if the height is 6, then the length will be twice its breadth. One alone is not sufficient. The moment you know one alone is not sufficient, eliminate option A and option C actually. Because option A says one alone, option 2 says either one alone or two alone. But we know that one alone cannot give the answer. Statement 2. The area of two walls of the room is 130. The area of two walls of the room is 130. The area of two walls of the room is 130. Now how will you use this statement? Tell me. Area of two walls of the room is 130. Area of two walls of the room is 130. How do you decide what information is given here in statement 2? Wait. Because which two walls has not been specified, right? How do you know which two walls is talking about? Area of two walls of the room can be cut. See, uh, what is the area? There are two types of walls, you know, right? The, the wall along the length and the wall along the breadth. So for the length wall, I mean length wall is not the right term, but for the wall along the length, what is the uh, area? L into H. For the breadth wall, which means the wall along the breadth, what is the area? B into H. Now, which two walls is he talking about? Is he talking about both the length walls or both the breadth walls or one length and one breadth wall? That is not clear, right? So, I can say there are three cases here. 2 times of L into H equals to 130 or 2 times of B into H equals to 130 or L into H plus B into H. Length wall plus breadth wall. Their area is 130. Which one should I case? Consider. 
the fact that it is not giving me concrete information the fact that it is not giving us concrete information tells us that I cannot establish anything from this data and the previous one anyway is just a condition it only says that length will be twice if the height is 6 now by the way even if you get to know the height is 6 how will you know what is length and what is breadth you getting my point so so statement 2 leads us to more confusion what is he giving us is he talking about the two walls along the length two walls along the breadth or one length wall and one breadth wall and even if you take let's say this one ideally it should be this one the area of the wall along the length plus the area of the wall along the breadth is 130 but there is one equation with three variables how will you solve this means h into l plus b equal to 130 huh? what is h what is l what is b we don't know anything can you put h equals to 6 here no how will you put it who told you it is 6 meters nobody knows so statement 2 also is not sufficient and you know that even if you combine nothing is going to come out of it because one itself is incomplete information two also is incomplete information so by taking both of them together will not get any will, will it will not make any sense so answer should be option d that both one and two together are not sufficient to answer the question both one and two together are not sufficient to answer the question option d both one and two together are not sufficient to answer the question I'm sure this would have some doubts. This would create some doubts in your mind. So let me read your comments. Pravalika says L into H is 130. How do you know Pravalika that L into H is 130? Sony also says L into H, B into H. Piyush says E. E is not the answer, Piyush. Answer should be D. Are you all clear with this? Can I go to the next one? I, I need a confirmation for this one. Only if you can confirm that you have understood, I'll take up the next question. Should I go for the next one? <coughs> next one, yes. Here's the next question. What is the sum of the two numbers? What is the sum of the two numbers? Look at the first statement. 5 7 of the number is less than 2 7 of the another number. Meaning, 5 7 of A is less than 2 7 of... 5 7 of the number is less than 2 7 of another number. Is less than 2 7 of another number. What information does it give me? It's an inequality, right? It's not an equation. It's a inequation, basically. It's an inequality. 5 7 of one number is less than 2 7 of another number. Fine. What will happen? I mean, all we know is 5 of A is less than 2 times of B. 5 times of A is less than 2 times of B. So what? For So statement 1 alone is not sufficient. And this, this will not give us any information because it's an inequality, right? Second statement, 40% of a number is equal to 50% of second number. Fine. 40% of a number meaning 2 by 5. Or 40% of a number A is equal to 50% of another number B. What will this give us? Nothing. 4A equals to 5B. 4A equals to 5B. Fine. But what do we want? We want A plus B equals to what? There is only one equation in two variables. Can you solve? No. So 2 also will not give you the answer. Now even if I combine the two statements, will I get anything? No. Because first one is not an equation, it's an inequation. And second one is one equation with two variables. You getting it? So, one alone and two alone are not required. Even the combination will not give us the answer. And, and you don't have to write these steps. I'm, I'm repeatedly telling you, don't write all these steps. You should be smart enough to read the statement and decide whether it is making sense or not. Whether it will give you the info answer or not. So answer again would be D. Data in both the statements are not sufficient to answer the question. Okay. Okay, here's the last one. In how many days can X, Y and Z together finish the work? First statement. X can do a piece of work in 12 days. Y can do in 15 days. Z can do in 18 days. Yes, one is enough. I mean, we know the data. Full data is given. So we can get the answer. Now don't do 1 by 12 plus 1 by 15 plus 1 by 18. That's nonsense. 
we can get the answer right we know the number of days required by x y and z respectively so we can find out how many days will they together finish the work second x and y can do in 12 days x and z can do in 10 days y and z can do in 15 days now this is a standard question type this also will give you the answer i don't have to explain you how and you should not even be solving it i mean you know x plus y equals to 1 by 12 x plus z equals to 1 by 10 and x y plus z equals to 1 by 15 so basically three equations and three variables can you solve yes you will get their individual capacities then will you get the total capacity yes then will you get the total number of days yes so two also gives you the answer so one gives you the answer two also gives you the answer which means option c either statement one alone can be taken or two alone can be taken to arrive at the answer so data sufficiency I think most of them were easy. In fact, all of them were easy. All the five questions were like, you can just read the statements and make it out if you will get the answer or not. If you know the concept, data sufficiency will be time saver. Yes. And, and not just data sufficiency, Sony. If you know the concept, everything is easy. Concept is important. I mean, you should be clear with the concept. If your conceptual clarity is high, then you can read the statements and figure out whether you'll be able to get it or not. So I think I'm I'm done for the I'm done for the day unless you guys want me to solve anything in particular. There are some questions on simplifications also, which I'm sure is delete task for you, right? Okay, let me just take this first one. It looks interesting, right? They're all powers of seven. Seven cube into square root of seven into cube root of seven divided by seven divided by cube root of square root of seven equals to seven power of what? So let me just take that. Here's the question. Solve it, all of you. 5 by 3. Nilab says 5 by 3, which is option 2. Prabalika says 7 by 3, which is option 5. Ajit says it should be option 4, 8 by 3. So what is happening? You guys are giving me like all the options. Three options have already been given. 5 by 3 or 8 by 3 or 7 by 3. What do you think is the answer? What do you think is the answer? Chalo, let's, let's solve this. Simple one, you just have to play with the powers. You guys may say that for everything I say simple one because everything is simple. You see 7 power 3 into square root of 7 is 7 power 1 by 2. This you should know, right? Square root of x is equal to x power 1 by 2. Cube root of x equals to x power 1 by 3. Fourth root of x equals to x power 1 by 4. That, that clarity you must have, right? So x power, so this is 7 power 3, this is 7 power 1 by 2, this is cube root of 7, which means 7 power 1 by 3 into 7 power 1 by 3. This divided by 7 power 1 divided by, now this is cube root of 7, uh, square, cube root of square root of 7. So it's like this, you see, square root of 7 is 7 power 1 by 2, whole to the power of 1 by 3. Listen, there is a square root of 7 inside that, so 7 power 1 by 2, and that is under cube root, so which means power 1 by 3. This is equal to 7 power what? You know, right, division, when there are two consecutive divisions, you always have to move from left to right. Don't get confused, don't divide these two first. In, in case of multiplication, remember, A into B into C is equal to A into B into C is equal to A into b into c is equal to a into c into b this property holds true whatever that property is called but that's not true for division like a divided by b divided by c so since both are division you'll divide whichever you want right a by b divided by c or a divided by b divided by c or a by c divided by b this is not true for multiplications and additions, it is true, but not for division. Okay, so first you have to divide the first two terms, get the result and then divide the result with the third term. Now, you know that when the bases are all equal and in multiplication form, the powers can be added. So this becomes 7 power 3 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3. Divided by 7 power 1. When the bases are equal and in division form, the powers can be subtracted. So minus 1. This divided by... 7 power, when the basis, I mean, when, when it's like a power m whole power n, it's a power m into n. So this becomes 1 by 2 into 1 by 3, which is 1 by 6. Done. You know the answer now. Work on the powers. Is equal to 7 power what? Hearing it, what are the what are different properties that we have used here? One is a power m 
into a power n equals to a power m plus n a power m divided by a power n a power m minus n a power m whole power n a power m into n all these are important rules on exponents you should learn you should learn all these rules because if such question starts coming in your exam these rules will come very handy no solve so basically this will be like 7 power 3 plus 1 by 2 minus plus 1 by 3 minus 1 now this again rule number 2 a power m divided by a power n will be equal to a power m minus, minus 1 by 6 equal to 7 power the question mark so basically the question mark here is equal to this simplify that so 3 minus 1 is 2 you understand plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3 minus 1 by 6 so question mark will be equal to 3 minus 1 is 2 and this is 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3 minus 1 by 6 so 6 is the same right 3 plus 2 5 minus 1 4 so 2 plus 4 by 6 which is 2 by 3 2 plus 2 by 3 2 plus 2 by 3 is 8 by 3 <coughs> option 4 will be the answer yep so why did you get 7 by 3 5 by 3 and all that stuff guys So I think I can close here. There are three, four more questions on simplifications. 136% of 105 minus 84 percent of 165. You are look out. Do that calculation. 136% of 105 will be 105% of 136. So 136 plus, uh, you know, 6.8. And 84% of 165 can be taken as 100% minus 16% let's say or maybe that also you can take it as 165% of 84 so 84 plus 42 plus 8.4 plus 4.2 and then do that calculation yeah 8 by 5 into 3 by 17 into 12 by 13 of 15 what will I do there you know how to do it right 74,973 plus 56,118 minus 32,756 equal to 60,372 plus what? Sure. You're lucky man, you're getting these type of questions in your exams. And then same one more arithmetic question. 1275.42 plus 8624.6 minus 894.54 minus 24.71. do it I, I can see that all the options have got different decimal places decimal values right I mean the value after the decimal is different so just work on the decimal part and get the answer that's the technique I mean look at the options and decide the immediate thing that strikes me is all the options have got different values after the decimal so just work on the decimal part why do you want to work on the full part yeah I'm giving you clues you have to work on it I mean there's no point in me solving it for you Similarly, in the previous question, you can just, I mean, the previous question is a very basic one. You can apply our method, digit by digit calculation method. In percentages, I've already told you. Okay, so with this, I think I'm done for the session. There are number series questions which I never take. I mean, there's nothing to do. Logic is given to you in the solutions. Follow that logic, you'll get the answer. And in the examination, remember, give it a try. Spend maybe 15 seconds per question. If you get it well and good otherwise skip and move to the next one okay so there's no point in taking up number series in live sessions other than that i think everything has been covered up so that's it uh, i hope all of you have had a good session uh, once again sorry about the delay in the start but i'm sure uh, the, the session made up for the delay there Anand Kumar says how to solve uh, data sufficiency question, without, how to do data sufficiency question without solving it. Anand, Anand, I'm, see, I, Anand I think uh, one, one point that I would like to say is that I have, uh, uh, what is this, oh, sorry, money, why did I keep money here? Uh, 
Okay, Anand, I have lost the track. What did Anand ask? Sorry, I felt something in my pocket and was curious. Uh, Anand, 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 Anand said, how do you solve data sufficiency without solving it? I mean, how do you do data sufficiency? See, Anand, data sufficiency is not a topic. It's, it's only one more way of asking questions from various topics. So for you to become a pro in data sufficiency, first of all, your concepts have to be highly clear across all the topics because data sufficiency can be asked on time and work, it can be asked on time and distance, it can be asked on profit and loss, it can be asked on simple components, it can be asked on any topic, including reasoning. So you have to be thorough with the concepts of each of those topics. Once you build those concepts and practice a few questions, then there is a step-by-step -step process when you're answering questions from data sufficiency. There are a few rules that you must remember. Like, you know, never use data from one statement into the other statement unless you are combining the two statements. Never mark the answer without reading all the statements, without going through all the statements. And go for a combination of the statements if and only if individually the statements have failed to get the answer. So if you follow these rules and, you know, if your concepts are clear, it, it automatically becomes easy. Maybe now you're finding it difficult because you're new to it. See, I'm assuming, Anand, you're new because I have been seeing you in live sessions regularly only for the last few sessions. So, so the point is, it's, it's easy. Don't worry about it now. I think I'm sure in a month's time when you are done with all the topics, you'll, you'll build your data sufficiency concepts automatically. It, it, it gets built. Yeah, data sufficiency is like a byproduct. When you're doing something automatically, it'll happen. It's, it's like that. Okay. So, so I think, yeah, that's about it. Let me close it here. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you once again for joining us. We will keep a meeting uh, through these live sessions. Your next live session, by the way, will be tomorrow. And I think you've got two live classes tomorrow because last week we could not do the session on English language. So this week we will do the English language of last week's only a mock exam and this week's only a mock exam. I mean, you understand what I'm trying to say, right? So two English language sessions tomorrow. I think 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. is the timing. Just check your calendar uh, for, for confirmation and do join us, right? Vaishnavi, we will take the two sessions. I'm sure you will learn a lot of that and get... Uh, prepared better for your IGPSQ exam. Thank you.